All right, welcome to this week's edition of the Zoom conference call. We have a wonderful guest this week, and Eagles head coach Greg Cronin will check in and, and see how everything is going from the coaching perspective. And first of all, Crow, how are you doing? How have you been managing the last, uh, boy, seven weeks now? Yeah, it's crazy you say that, seven weeks. I didn't even realize it was that long. And we almost get into our own, our own little routine. I've been definitely following the government's orders. I've been sheltering in place, whatever interaction I've had with people. It's been running along the, the Cache La Poudre River there, um, just running a lot like Forrest Gump here around Fort Collins just to try and stay active. But, um, you know, it's been an opportunity for me, honestly, to just kind of do an inventory of where I'm at with my life in terms of my, you know, some of my investments and property that I own and then reconnecting with people that uh, are giving me some visibility in the future to uh, maximize those. That's, uh, that's wonderful. And I know that uh, you're a guy that's uh, pretty tenacious when it comes to, to your workout regimen. So have you had to start moving some of those things indoors into the house besides the running you talked about? Are you finding a way to work out inside? Yeah, I actually, um, you know, when they, when they closed the Budweiser Center off, um, it was like a mad scramble to grab some dumbbells out of the Budweiser Center since nobody's going to use them. So <laughs> I'm the head coach, so I got, I got first dibs. So I brought some dumbbells home and a bench home. And I, I have three floors here in this townhouse I rent. So it's fortunate I've just taken one of the floors and used that. Now, my brother came out a week ago. He was going stir crazy in Boston. So he figured he'd go stir crazy in here in Fort Collins with me. And um, so his, his, his bedroom is the weight room. And uh, we've been fortunate to go hiking a few times and just hang out and watch a lot of Netflix stuff. Good. Well, I'm glad you have each other in there. And that, that's awesome. I'm glad you're doing well. And yeah, always uh, we like to use this as an opportunity to get some questions from the fans and, and throw them your way. And we have a lot of questions that uh, fans have submitted. We'll pick some of the best here. And we'll start off one that uh, I think is, is, is a good launching point into the conversation. And this is from Kayla. And she says, how has your coaching experience been with the Eagles over these past two seasons? Well, it's interesting. The, the league, I mean, I was in the league a long time ago, uh, 2003. It started with uh, Bridgeport. And the AHL uh, has evolved into a really high priority for organizations. Back then, it was kind of like a – it was hard to describe it, but you had similar dynamics. You had veterans that were trying to get another lifeline to their careers and uh, – earned some money before they exited that hockey fraternity. And then you had draft picks um, that really uh, were not really, I wouldn't say they were like NHL um, bona fide players. I think a lot of the first rounders back then went maybe a year in the American League or not a year at all and went right to the NHL. It was kind of a different dynamic. And now you're seeing outside of the top five, 10 picks in the draft. You're seeing a lot of guys spend a year or two. You know, Martin Kout's a good example. Bowers might be on that trajectory. Timmons is a good example. Uh, where they, and pretending on the, the depth of the organizations where they have to really learn how to be a professional. And in the developmental teams, you know, the Wilsies and the Ryan Prex and the Clocks, they weren't even part of the AHL back then. So to go back to the question, um, you know, it's a totally different animal than it was back then. And in terms of organizational support and organizational resources, and at the end of the day, everybody has the same vision, which is to develop players and win, but not all 30 teams can win. And that's where the, that's where the, the commitment from management, guys like Craig Billington and Joe Sackick and Chris McFallon, uh, influences the team so that you, the fans, can actually watch the young guys like the Bowers and the, the Frank Cooses and the Greers and the Graves and all these guys. You watch them play, which is really enjoyable, and you watch them playing in one environment, which is a real challenge uh, in the American League now. Uh, and a question here. This is from Aaron, and uh, probably one that I'm sure a lot of fans uh, have a question about with any. Uh, any coaching staff is how do you and your staff decide which players are going to be in the lineup and which players might be a healthy scratch in a particular night? Well, we're, we're very performance driven. I mean, there's a, there's a, there's a mandate from, from management when you have certain players on coming out. I mean, the average fan would know that your first round picks, your second round picks, they're, they're going to get a lot of freedom to make mistakes and, 
they're still going to be held accountable to a standard. And ultimately, whatever we do in life, there's going to be a standard. It's going to be clearly visible to everybody within that team, whatever organization is, whatever organization you're working in. And then the accountability to that standard is really the responsibility of the coaching staff. Now, that accountability standard might be a little bit fuzzy for a younger guy because they're just, they're still, you know, trying to learn how to play the right way. Um, so the younger guys are going to play pretty much every game. And then there's a mixture of guys in the middle that are, that aren't really young anymore. And they're trying to punch through that reliability layer where they're going to be legitimate AHL players and possibly NHL uh, call-up players. And in that band of players, we will try and decide which one deserves to play over another from game to game performances. Now, when you make those decisions, you have to be – the players in the room have – they know, we tell them, that the younger guys, whether you like it or not, are going to play. The older guys, the veterans like the Condras, you know, the Alts, the Tynans, they're not going to get sat unless there's a veteran problem. So it's that group of players in the middle that may get sat out just because there's – going to be healthy competition for those spots. I know it's a long answer to a real simple question, but I'm sure you're looking for really like really what's going on when that happens. And it's not like I'm watching the game from the stands and I see, you know, whoever's playing poorly, he should go out. It doesn't work that way. Yeah, no, it makes sense. And, and again, I think it, it provides some great insight. And one thing that I think fans maybe don't get to see is just how much time you guys put in as a staff into dissecting video and from the, the minute that the game is over, you guys are already pouring over along with Steven Petrovic, what's happened, what you saw, what jumped out at you. Can you kind of give a sense of it? It's almost like a, a week's worth of preparation in a football game that goes into sometimes a 12 hour window between games on a back to back. Well, one of the things that we've integrated and I think it's been really, really healthy is we've actually, we, Steven Petrovic videotapes practice. So there's a consistency in what we try and teach. And we keep using the word transparency. I call them events that happen during games. Like the average fan, they get, they get teased by the goals, the fancy plays, the big hits, the fights. You know, that's what kind of draws the fans in. Ultimately, the, the, the effort that goes um, underneath that, that event is what we feel is going to allow people to be successful. And this gets really complicated, but... The game's not football. We don't stop to play, put the center over the ball, blow the whistle, and then run a play where everybody on the field's preparing for a strategy. It doesn't work that way in hockey. The only time that happens is on like a power play breakout or a face-off. Um, so what we try to do is we try to catalog events that happened in the course of a game that allow our team to be successful. And those, those events are transferable to an NHL game. One of the benefits that I have is I spent 12 years in the NHL as a coach. So I, I can see how these events in the American League are directly linked to the events in the NHL. And without going through each one of them, I'll give the average, the average hockey fan knows that, and you feel the stress in the game when the puck, when you're defending a lead and it's late and the puck gets sent up the wall to the wing from the defenseman at the goal line. So we're defending our D zone, it goes up the wall, we're defending a lead. Every team in the league is going to send their defenseman barreling down the wall. Why do some teams get that puck out consistently and other teams don't? Well, there's a skill that happens within a second or two from the moment that puck leaves the defenseman's stick to the moment it hits our winger's stick. And I'm not going to get into all that, but that would be something that we would actually look at and define as an event that makes that player more reliable to exit the zone, it makes our team more successful to then attack instead of defending in a one goal lead. And during the week of practice, we will actually do drills that are specifically designed to have that component in it. And we're playing against a team like teams that watch Tucson who constantly have their D going down the boards. We would show that practice to the players prior to that weekend series just to reinforce the priority to be able to do that during the course of the game. So, I, I mean, I, I've seen it before in college. It's unique here in the American League because we do have, you know, three weeks out of the month where we play on a Saturday and we don't play again until a Friday. So you've got this body of work, which for me is just as valuable as a game on Tuesday to try and create that standard for the player. And um, I, I, we find that the players, we always ask in our players, particularly the veterans, 
if we're overloading them, if we're overcoaching them, there's got, there's got to be a balance, right? And uh, they've been very good, the Condras and the Tynans of the world and the Magnus and say, no, this is awesome. It's even helping us get better. And then when we talk to Jared and the, uh, and the Avalanche organization, that you'll hear that comment come out from their staff. These guys are ready. You can tell they've been prepared to play at this level. And, and that's really that transparency we're creating from Joe Sackick all the way down to, say, a Steve Petrovic. Yep. Uh, it's great insight and, and certainly uh, great for the fans to hear it. Uh, another question coming from a fan here. This comes from Kaylee. Uh, she says, in what areas have you seen the most improvement from your team this year? Well, I think the power play, um, as you know, a year ago, uh, you know, we had limited talent. And I mean, to be little, uh, minimize the plays that, that played on our team last year, because we worked really hard. I think we were one of the hardest working teams in our division. And we knew we had to work hard to be successful. So I think Ryan Tobler had a really rough time. And me too, I tried to help him try and put together a power play group that could actually be a threat and instead of a source of nerves, right? Because we just we were last in the league, I believe, in power play last year. But in order for a power play to be successful, you need a half wall player. That's the guy that controls the puck up and down the wall. And um, Agazino really wasn't that type of player. We had to put him there because we didn't really have anybody else. Jolie can do that, um, but he's not as experienced as a guy like Tynan. And Aggie's more of a of a down low and a goal line type of guy. And we didn't have a power play quarterback up top. And what we got this year was T.J. Tynan, who had established a great reputation as a power play guy. And then Timmons, who was a bit of a wild card, but had a history of being really good back there. Then the Rosen helped. And, of course, in addition to him, is having McDonald. So you had an absence of any of those players last year. And then as and Ryan and I sat down and discussed strategy quite a bit, how to maximize the personnel. And we struggled early. I think I was I was making mistakes trying to force guys into positions that I was comfortable um, designing based upon me as a penalty killing coach, uh, looking at what power play setups gave us problems. And we sort of morphed away from that about 20 games prior to the season ending. And I give Ryan Tober a lot of credit for staying with it. And I believe our power play over the last 20 games was at like 23%, which would have put it in the top five. And uh, really, you look at that, it's a combination of just learning from mistakes from the coaches and then putting players like Tynan and, and Rose, not Rosen so much, but McDonald, Connaughton, and Timmons in positions to be successful. Yeah. Um, a question here, this is uh, from Brandy and, and maybe one that's uh, a little bit more uh, based in, in sort of your philosophies, but who are some of your coaching inspirations, uh, either past or present? Um, it's a good question. I actually had a good conversation with Ryan Clark from The Athletic about this a few weeks ago. I mean, you know, at, at whatever we do in life, there are certain people that are going to, I call them intersections, that are going to come into these intersections in our life. And usually those happen when you're either looking for a job or you've lost a job, which means you're looking for a job, right? So when you... When, like in my situation, when I when I started coaching, I had a guy named Sean Walsh, and you know the listeners should Google him because he was an unbelievable coach. I was just actually talking to a couple of former players from my days of coaching at UMaine in the late '80s and early '90s who look back at him as really way ahead of his time. I mean, he died when he was 42, I believe, of cancer and he had over 300 wins. He, po he coached Paul Career and Goss Snow and Jimmy Howard. I mean, the list of players we had back then is unbelievable. But his, just to make this real quick, his preparation and his ability to communicate a vision of what he expected in a real passionate way was extremely contagious to me. I had never seen that before. Um, he, was, he was pot salesman. Uh, and I mean that in a good way. And, and that really translated with recruiting. I mean, getting a guy like Paul Correa to go to UMaine when he could have gone to Michigan or Wisconsin or North Dakota or a BU. I mean, that spoke to his sales skills. And then his ability to manage people in terms of like time management situations and giving guys roles. And he was fearless in his devotion to maximizing those people. I, I, I really look back and that was... Yeah, I mean, 25 years ago, I think, when I was last with him, 
maybe longer, but it was just fascinating. And then the other guy that I thought, and you guys see him, you see him on NBC, uh, Sen, and he's on other hockey shows is Mike Milbury. He's infamous for going into the stands in Madison Square Garden and whacking a guy in the head with a shoe with the big bad Bruins. And here's a guy that I grew up watching play when hockey was Neanderthal, no helmets. There were multiple fights a game. And, um, you know, you had that image of people, but Mike, who's always been controversial because he speaks what he feels and he's not worried about hurting people's feelings. But he was the first guy that I work with in pro hockey that, that taught me about creating a relationship with a player that went into almost like a spiritual side. Like what can you do to get into a guy's heart and his soul to get him to trust you, to believe in you so that you could create that accountability and discipline. Uh, Sean did it with organization and preparation and Mike did it with, with inspiration. Those were two people that were early in my career that I think created some really good, reliable roots to who I am as a person. No, that's awesome. That's uh, very, very interesting to hear. And uh, another question that uh, changes things a little bit, uh, a question, this is from Alyssa, and it speaks to the fact that you have been in the NHL, the collegiate levels. She wants to know, how do the fans here with the Colorado Eagles at the Budweiser Event Center compare to the ones you've seen at the NHL and the collegiate levels? There's no, there's no other fan base. The only other thing I saw close to this, um, so I, I'll, I'll go back to the, the, the NHL and the college in a second. The only fan base I've seen close to this was when I was coaching in Bridgeport and they still probably have them in, in Hershey, but Hershey and Wilkes-Barre always had really good support in the American league. Like, you know, that when you went in there, it didn't matter what night it was, they were going to have a devoted fan base, whether the team was 500 or they were in first place. Um, and this is the closest environment I've seen to that. Um, in college, it's, you just don't get the same, um, crowds every night in a college game. I mean, at home we did at Maine. Maine was like the one sport in town that would, you know, would really be the, uh, for me, it would be like the, the NHL environment for college because there was no other pro team to compete with, with BU and BC and Providence. They were dealing with other sports. And the NHL, obviously, it doesn't have the size. You don't have the 17, 18, 20,000 people. But I, I really believe this, and this is not like my brother comes up to games and he's a big sports fan and he's been, you know, the college football stadiums and the NHL games. He followed my career when I was in the NHL at Toronto and in New York. And he, he made a comment that I think is really, uh, really unique is that he found that the fans here were very well educated, that they, when they went to a game, they just weren't cheering for fights. Like they understood the game. He loved their passion for the refereeing. <laughs> Like uh, he never saw fans so smart about what was, should have been a call, what shouldn't have been a call. And usually when you drill into that dynamic, that means the fans are pretty smart. They know what's going on, what's an offside, what's a hook, what's a hold. So, uh, and he's not the first guy that's come out here to watch a game with me or a game to watch our, our team and visit me and say, wow, the fans are really, really, they're really smart. And, and they're classy too. Um, the guys down the back end where we don't have stands yet to my left, they might lack a little bit of class in terms of what their narrative is during the game, <laughs> but we need those at the game. So everybody's had a great experience here. Good. That, that's wonderful to hear. And uh, just to wrap things up, uh, a question here. This is from Sean. So far, what has been your favorite memory of coaching for the Colorado Eagles? It's, you know, it's amazing. I've never been asked that question before, but as soon as he asked me that, it has to be when we beat San Jose the last game a year ago. Okay. And that last, you know, whatever it was, eight games where it was just jockeying back and forth with San Diego and Tucson for that last spot. And then losing that night in San Jose and, and you know, we, at home against San Jose was a Friday. And then a Saturday we had beat San Jose and we were all watching the scoreboard. Yeah. And I don't know if Sean was at the arena at that point, but we had the San Diego Tucson game on. And um, San Diego's coach, Dallas Akins, is a good friend of mine. And I had, I had texted him before the game that I was going to reward his team with a team bonus if they were able to win the game. And we were all glued to that, right? Because we had won. We were a point ahead of them, whatever the – I can't remember what the point total was. And we were doing fan night. So we had the fans, you know, parading through the rink to get their jersey signed. And Martin Lind had come down to celebrate our win and to cheer on San Diego so that we could go to the playoffs. 
And I've never been in a situation like that ever coaching ever to have that event take place when we're signing jerseys and have the scoreboard showing the Tucson San Diego game and the sense of relief I had when the game was over, because I don't know if our fans remember, but San Diego took five penalties in the third period and Tucson went 0 for five on the power play. Yeah. It's amazing that we were able to squeak into the playoffs. So for me, knowing the avalanche hadn't had an AHL team make the playoffs for eight years, knowing the success the Eagles have had at different levels in the, in minor league hockey, so the expectation to make it from that minor league level and the lack of success at the NHL, AHL level, for me, that, that just converged into one like 30-minute span of time that was filled with nerves and excitement. So honestly, Sean, it had nothing to do with me coaching. It had everything to do with what was going on in the scoreboard. Oh, that was awesome. And I think uh, Eagles fans loved that. And, and you heard that roar from the crowd when that, uh, that final buzzer went off. Uh, between San Diego and Tucson. That was a, a wonderful moment. Well, uh, Coach, appreciate you taking the time and uh, we'll hope to catch up with you here uh, in the weeks to come. Who knows, maybe we can get things uh, revved back up. But uh, in the meantime, we'd love to catch up with you in the weeks to come. Uh, best of luck and, and continued success uh, just managing things as they go right now. And we appreciate you taking the time with us today. All right, my pleasure. Everybody stay safe. All right, thank you so much. That's Greg Cronin, the head coach of the Colorado Eagles. That is this week's Zoom conference call.